So again, my name is Caitlin Saposi Belknap. I live in Eureka, California. I work with uh, Move to Amend on the executive committee, and um, I'm the field organizing coordinator. And um, today we're going to cover just very quickly an overview of starting a Move to Amend group, just some review, and then focusing on facilitation and good meetings, uh, democratic decision making, the consensus process, just kind of meetings in general, some things to keep in mind, tips for facilitators, and then Q&A. And um, so let's go ahead and get started. So just as a quick review, I know many of you are already affiliate coordinators, and so you already have affiliate groups. Um, but just to remind folks who are not that that's really what we're encouraging, and we are a grassroots um, locally based campaign. And at this point, we have about 70 affiliates across the country um, in a majority of the states. And uh, we'd love to have more groups. It's easy to get started holding, having a group. You can just hold an organizing meeting and invite your friends, and then we can help you publicize an announcement to the petition signers who are on our list in your area who could come. And then one of the things that we suggest you get started doing right away is involving the greater public. So holding an event like a teach-in or a movie showing or bringing Move to Amend to your community via one of our barnstorming tours, um, hosting a study group, or just starting to collect signatures for Move to Amend. You could table at farmer's markets or um, outside of grocery stores to just start to get the word out. And of course, our um, key effort in 2012 is to get uh, Move to Amend resolutions on local ballots via the ballot initiative process. So um, our last webinar was on that topic, so I won't go into it today, but um, that's our key goal, to get 50 towns and cities to have our resolution on the ballot, and there's a number who have joined already. And then once you kind of get going with your group, uh, we ask you to officially affiliate with Move to Amend, um, and there's a pretty simple, straightforward application process. There's an application to form, to form a group, and then we uh, hold an orientation call for you and your group members. And our goals for affiliates are that you emphasize coalition building and movement building in your work that you're doing, that you use the Move to Amend name, that you add petition signers that you collect locally to our database, and then we share the folks who come in through the website with you, that you have a democratic internal process, and that's part of what we'll talk about today, how to have your meetings in such a way that is democratic and transparent, and that you have a commitment to anti-oppression and movement building um, through your organizing and your internal power structure. And then the goal is for local affiliates to grow to have state chapters, um, and those state chapters will have representation on our national steering committee. So we're building a representative democratic organization from the ground level. So if you have any questions about any of that, there's contact info at the end of this, um, but that's just a quick review if you are not already a Move to Amend affiliate. So let's go ahead and get started on facilitation and meetings. First, I just want to start with some grounding in our political principles that Move to Amend, because that um, is going to kind of guide where I'll be coming from in terms of what we suggest you do for making decisions and how you um, structure your group and things like that. So we have a commitment to building a broad multiracial movement, and we ask our affiliates to participate in that as well. That's really actually where the rubber meets the road in building this movement, is at the local level through our local groups. Uh, we have a real strong commitment and background in grassroots democracy and local organizing. And we're in it for the long haul, so we're not looking for the quickest, simplest solution. We're looking for the most systemic and um, far-reaching solutions. And our long-term agenda is systemic change and real democracy. So, of course, we're very committed to this amendment campaign that we're working on, but these are sort of the underlying principles that are guiding what choices we're making as we're doing this amendment campaign and where we're coming from even after we get this amendment passed, which we are gonna do. So I wanna talk a little bit initially about democratic decision making, and there's some implicit beliefs that um, are behind democratic decision making. And so I'm just gonna run through those. The first one is that people are intelligent and capable and wanna do the right thing. 
Also, that groups can make better decisions than any one person can make alone. Everyone's opinion is of equal value, regardless of rank or position. And people are more committed to the ideas and plans that they have helped to create. Participants can and will act responsibly in assuming true accountability for their decisions. Groups can manage their own conflicts, behaviors, and relationships if they are given the right tools and training. And the process, if well-designed and honestly applied, can be trusted to achieve results. So in some ways, the key that we'll be talking about today is this last bullet, but you know how to design a process that's well-designed and honestly applied to get good results. But the other, other points are really key uh, towards guiding us in terms of um, what we're suggesting, how you structure your meetings, and how you even just think of what the purpose is that you're bringing together. And I know, you know, I've been in, I've, I've been a facilitator for many years. I've been involved in many groups, so I definitely know that there can be groups and meetings where remembering these principles can be really challenging, and it can feel as though this is not actually what's going on, and this is not what's guiding people in terms of the choices or ways that they're conducting themselves. So one suggestion and tip I have for all of you is to go over this list with your group. Um, and you'll see that I'm gonna talk a bunch about transparency. And so having a little bit of a discussion with your group about these implicit beliefs or these principles um, and getting clarity on um, whether everyone agrees with this and is, you know, can conduct themselves in a way that um, is, is most trying to make these beliefs come true and remembering these kind of the best things about people working together, which this is sort of trying to draw on, can be a good idea. So in terms of democratic decision making, there's basically two participatory ways to make decisions as a group. You can use majority rule or you can use consensus. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about modified consensus. And as I said before, either option that you choose, transparency is really key. But I'm going to talk mostly today about consensus. One, because um, our society really focuses a lot on majority rule. So we're more familiar with majority rule. We're more comfortable being in um, decision making settings where majority rule is used oftentimes, that's more familiar, what we see and have heard about. And, um, and so also we oftentimes conduct ourselves as if we're in a majority rule setting, even if we're not. And then the other reason is that for all of those kind of, um, for all the drawbacks with majority rule, part of why I want to go, I went through the implicit beliefs of democratic decision making is that we have a real strong suggestion that folks use um, a modified consensus process and a consensus seeking process because it is more democratic and it allows you to fully um, draw on those implicit beliefs of democratic decision making more fully. Um, the consensus process just lends itself to that. So a lot of people though have had negative experiences with consensus and or assumptions about consensus um, so it's worth going through how to use it in a way that is efficient and um, what are some of the most important things to do to make sure that consensus works well. So some of the things about consensus is that it asks participants to make decisions in the best interest of the group. And this isn't necessarily something that we're used to being asked to do. So um, it's an intentional um, mindset that we kind of have to put ourselves in when we're in a consensus seeking process. Consensus is proposal driven, um, and the idea there is as opposed to maybe um, individual ideas driven. And so the goal with consensus is to come up with a proposal that works for everyone, and not just works for everyone in that everyone's sort of lukewarm about it and it's kind of the lowest common denominator, <laughs> but more a proposal that everyone is committed to and willing to work on because people are not going to work on things that they don't feel committed to. And so part of um, the whole purpose of consensus is to, do the, to take the time needed to get to that idea proposal 
that um, allows everyone to see their investment in it, and so then they'll follow through and implement the decision. All of that means that consensus can take more time. Not necessarily, um, but certainly consensus can take more time, and getting a group to a proposal that everyone feels committed to can take more of an investment. But it does ensure more buy-in, to use that you know, in quotes term, uh, from a larger number of people and that means that a larger number of people are committed to carrying through the decision. So I'm going to walk you through the steps, and some of you may be familiar with this already, and there are some different ways to do consensus, but I'm going to walk through kind of the broad steps of the most basic kind of consensus process. So one thing that's really important when using consensus is that everyone understand um, that, that the process and how to participate. Um, so that they don't uh, start doing things that are getting in the way of the consensus process and or feeling disempowered because they don't actually know how to participate on equal footing with the folks who do know the process. So it's worth having the, these steps written up and covering them at the beginning of your every meeting, um, especially if you have new folks, but even if you don't, just to remind everybody and to, kind of, again, kind of get your group in the mindset of, they're there to think about um, making decisions for the best for the best of the group. So the first thing to do is to state the issue. What are we talking about? So the facilitator can ask the person who brought the issue to the group to frame the issue. So if you have an agenda and you know you have several items on it, it can be a good idea to have one or two people responsible for each item to kind of frame it out and state what it is that you're that you're supposed to be discussing and where it is that you'd like to be um, with the proposal, the proposal that you're going to, you know, what, what decision is it that you ultimately want to come to with this issue. So um, as part of that, clarifying the question, what needs to be decided? So the facilitator or that framer person will make it really clear to the group what it is that they're deciding. And that can be important for, um, because you're going to then allow the group to go into discussion, sometimes discussion can take you all over the place. So being really clear about reminding the group, well, is that really what we need to be deciding or is it this? And that's the facilitator's job above all to make sure that the group stays on topic and stays clear on that issue of what needs to be decided. So then to frame the discussion, um, you want to find out what are all the different viewpoints? What are all the different ideas or things that need to be factored in or weighed on making this decision? So the facilitator can ask each person to speak to the issue. You can do that as a go around. You can kind of have just an open, what's called stack, where people just get to uh, chime in. And of course, there are techniques that you can use to help make sure that as many people as possible are participating in this discussion. So out of the discussion um, should come some proposals, some ideas for action um, that come out of the discussion. So the facilitator can um, be the one who's responsible for identifying if in when somebody's talking, it basically sounds as though they're making a proposal. Or um, this, the participants can actually frame their points in terms of a proposal, if they have a clear idea of what they'd like to suggest happen. So you can either have that kind of happen organically from the discussion or the facilitator can explicitly kind of end the discussion and, and ask for proposals of action and the idea is that those proposals should incorporate the viewpoints that have been raised during the discussion. And then after a proposal has been made or maybe a couple different proposals, um, you want to go back into discussion, basically ask people to speak to the proposal. So not the discussion from before, but kind of to really focus their comments on um, the clarifying questions or support or concerns about the proposals that have been made. And then comes the time to, in light of any concerns or clarifying questions, see if the proposals need to be modified, basically friendly amendments um, to the proposal to help make it better or to help it incorporate concerns that have been raised. Or maybe uh, the group finds that um, concerns are so compelling that it's worth it to withdraw the proposal and see if it, there are better proposals to come forward. 
So in some ways, this is kind of an organic process. It's not, you know, necessarily always very clear which which moment you're in, whether you're in, you know, discussion or making of the proposals. And that's sort of the facilitator's job to kind of tease that out, but it's also the group's job to help the facilitator to do that. So framing your points to make sure that you're on topic, that you're addressing the proposals, if you're really introducing a new proposal, that there's clarity around that. And all of this is something that is easier to do with practice. So then um, you test for consensus. And um, I'm gonna talk in just one minute about how to do that. And then, and then you reach consensus and then you get to decision implemented. So let me go for a second to the process to test for consensus and they'll come back to eight and nine. So um, the way to test for consensus is to basically, uh, once your group kind of has, has a, a proposal that has kind of come out of all of this discussion, um, what you want to do is start to move it more explicitly into getting a decision made. So the first thing to do is to ask for their any call for concerns. Find out if there are still any concerns that the proposal has not addressed. And um, the best way to do that is to really clearly restate the proposal. So if you're the facilitator or maybe a person who's taking notes, get to the point where you know you clearly restate the proposal once again for everyone and ask if there's anyone who still has concerns. Um, and then if there are, ask the person with concerns to restate them and then you might go back into discussion at this point to kind of try and massage that proposal to address those concerns. The next step after you voice the concerns um, and you've either massaged them out or maybe they're still there is to call for objections within consensus or stand asides is another way to describe that. So if people still have concerns, even after they've been thoroughly discussed, then the facilitator asks if those folks with remaining concerns are willing to stand aside, which is basically, at this point, I don't really agree with what's gonna happen, but I can live with it. And just to be more explicit about it, I can live with it and I will help the group implement that decision. Maybe I won't be on you know, the core committee to make it happen, but I'm not going to get in the way later. I'm not gonna to continue to raise my concerns. And honestly, I'm not really even going to go into like I told you so mode if this isn't the best idea. But I, you know, I'm gonna put aside my own personal concerns and I can get along with what's gonna happen here and I, I can go for it. So I'll stand aside. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Uh, someone just needs their concern voiced or on the record or, um, or just, you know, to be heard. So uh, you could still move forward in consensus with stand asides. And then the last thing is a call for blocks. So if the folks with concerns really feel as though they cannot stand aside, then the facilitator asks if they are blocking. And if blocking, if, they're, if the proposal is blocked under consensus, um, then it is dropped or discussed further to again come back to trying to address those concerns or um, maybe sent to a committee to continue to try and iron it out and come back. Maybe the group just needs more time. I do want to make a note about blocking. Blocking should only be used when there's a strong moral disagreement or the belief that the decision will damage the group. It's not to be taken lightly and kind of the way that I think about it is that um, you really should only have one or two occasions, if that, that you ever block in your lifetime. And another way to think about it would be um, that you, if the group were to go forward with the proposal, you would have a serious kind of moral and personal quandary about whether to stay involved with the group, whether you would be able to keep doing um, working with the group because um, what they're suggesting is kind of so out of line with where you think things need to go. So it really is an ethical or moral um, decision blocking and a lot of times because of our majority rule society where it's easy to vote no under majority rule, um, that's a block kind of gets conflated with a no vote 
And that's really not what it is. It's that you're blocking the group from implementing the decision. And the idea with true consensus or you know full consensus is that um, it, one individual, um, when when exercising their blocking power responsibly, should be able to um, to do that to stop the group from moving forward. So it's not something to be taken lightly. One thing to just a lot of people get concerned about you know the blocking um, option because. Uh, that really, one, goes against the idea of majority rule, and then two, you know, it, there is some valid reasons why one individual maybe should not be in a position to be able to um, block where the group goes. So, what to do about that? Our suggestion is that you use modified consensus. And what modified consensus is, is basically you strive to reach the consensus, you go through the consensus process, you follow all the steps that I outlined, but then if you get to that point where you have um, people who really cannot in good conscience agree to go forward, um, maybe uh, they don't actually fully understand the block, maybe they're not fully um, in the loop about the group, rather than allowing that one individual to basically stop the whole group in its tracks, you use a fallback vote of a supermajority. You would never, I don't think, want to use a fallback of just a simple majority, 50% plus one. But using a supermajority helps ensure that you're still not just steamrolling over the minority's concerns, but at the same time, you're not allowing yourself to get stalled by one person. And modified consensus is really, I've worked in groups that have used the full consensus process for, um, going on 10 years now, the organization that I work for uses consensus, and, you know, I really um, am committed to that. But on the other hand, sometimes, and especially with Move to Amend affiliates or other groups that are open to the public or where strangers can just come in, there's really good reasons to use modified consensus so that um, you don't just have strangers who either are not enough in the loop to really be given that uh, full blocking power or um, not committed enough to the group to be giving that full blocking power if they just show up one day. And honestly, if it's open to the public entirely, they may not be committed to the group's principles or goals at all. In fact, they may be somebody who is there intentionally to disrupt the group and you are need to protect your group to make sure that um, folks like that are not able to basically uh, completely stymie your efforts. So a fallback or a modified consensus option um, can be a good way to get around that. So our recommendation for new affiliate groups is that you use modified consensus, that you really you know, go through the um, steps and that you learn how to use the consensus process so that folks are familiar with it and um, skilled in it. And then um, you still have that fallback vote of either two thirds or three quarters of your group and you can choose to have it be of people in the room or maybe, you know, official members. Sometimes folks will also say that um, a person doesn't have blocking power unless they've been to a certain number of meetings, just to, again, try to make sure that they really understand um, and are committed to the group before you give them that kind of power in the group. I do see that there are some questions, but because of the way my screen is set up, I can only see part of them. So I'm going to uh, take the questions at the end and I'll go back through. And I kind of see out of the corner of my eye that there are a few folks who maybe are not, um, who are here to talk more about Move to Amend in general. And I just want to underscore, because of the technical difficulties at the beginning, I forgot to mention that these webinars really are geared for our affiliate leaders and anyone is welcome to participate. And certainly I can answer as many of the questions as I can get through at the end. But in terms of what we're going to focus on here, it really is on having good meetings and facilitation. So this is not a general discussion about Move to Amend. Um, there are some webinars, the orientation webinar and some of the earlier webinars that I encourage folks to watch those recordings if you want to get that. So I'm going to keep plugging along here. There's not very many slides left, so we will have a fair amount of time for questions still. And just cover some of the meeting roles that um, you want to utilize. Some of these are optional and some of them are not so much. 
first is the facilitator, and obviously the facilitator in a lot of ways is one of the most key roles in a meeting for helping determine if things go well or not. Um, the facilitator is responsible for a number of different things, including starting and ending the meeting on time, uh, helping to create the agenda based on other people's input. So sometimes that can be a committee of folks. Um, it doesn't have to be just the facilitator, but the facilitator should be very familiar with the agenda and the goals and outcomes expected and um, desired for the meeting. Presenting the agenda for review, setting times for each topic. Um, again, that can happen by committee when you make the agenda in the first place, but the facilitator is definitely responsible for making sure that um, those times are kept too. Introducing each topic and suggesting how it will be discussed. You can also, as I said, have a framer if there's somebody who um, is kind of bringing some background to a particular topic, um, whether it's background on you know what has been discussed already or some important research that happened to kind of frame out the discussion. The facilitator doesn't need to frame every topic, but helping to make sure that when you, before you get to the discussion part, everyone is clear about what outcome you're trying to get. Um, keeping the discussion focused and on topic, coordinating a decision-making process. Uh, in this case, you know, walking, walking through that consensus process is the responsibility of the facilitator. Bringing each discussion to a close with clarity about who's doing what next and how a decision is going to be implemented and closing the meeting by reviewing what decisions have been made and also allowing time for evaluation of feelings and also productivity of the meeting and making sure that a next time and location for the next meeting has been set and thanking people for coming. Those are all things for a facilitator to keep in mind. The scribe is the person who's responsible for writing ideas up on a flip chart uh, so that everyone can keep track of what's being said. A lot of times uh, folks don't have somebody doing this at a meeting, but it's a good thing to do um, in part because we all learn differently. So some people are auditory learners, but a lot of people are also visual learners. And so if you have a meeting where your only notes are being taken by somebody in front of a computer or on a pad, um, and then everything else is happening just via discussion, that is that puts the visual learners who are a good percentage of the population at a disadvantage because they're not necessarily able to absorb things as quickly if, um, and as thoroughly if it's only being discussed. So that's why it's helpful to have a scribe who's kind of not, you know, not taking verbatim notes at all, but when you're um, in discussion, adding key points, when decisions have been made, um, or propose, writing up the proposal so that people can see it before testing for consensus can be helpful to make sure you get to um, consensus. So keeping in mind those different styles of, of learning um, and also absorbing information. A stacker is not a required uh, responsibility, but that can be helpful. This can also be like a co-facilitator so somebody who is um, keeping a list of who wants to speak. This can also be done by one facilitator. It's sort of up to um, oftentimes the facilitator what their preference is, whether they are able to keep track of both the threads of the discussion and who wants to go next. But especially if you have um, inexperienced facilitators or you're trying to help your group take on more roles and learn how to facilitate, it can be helpful to peel out the stacker role because um, it's not as easy as you'd think to keep track of whose turn it is to talk while you're listening to the discussion. So if somebody is charged with that, that can be helpful to kind of um, a first step towards facilitating a meeting is to be the stacker. And it can also help make sure that the facilitator is able to um, keep track of the threads of the conversation rather than whose turn it is. It, but, it, but the stacker, whoever it is, whether it's the facilitator or a separate person, the trick is to make sure that even though you're listening to the speaker and you wanna you know, make eye contact and um, all of that good stuff, you also need to make sure that your eyes are constantly scanning the other participants to keep track of if somebody wants to talk and they, if they put their hand up 
so that you can you know write them down is the best way to do that and um, that way you don't have to remember it all in your brain but whose turn it is to go next and all of that if a facilitator is not doing that or the stacker is not doing that that can be a really good way to make the discussion go people get distracted because they haven't been seen and then they're trying to wave their arms in the air to get heard and um, so that's one of the key things is just make sure you're scanning the room and like I said it's harder a harder trick to remember than you'd think. The note taker is responsible for taking more detailed notes of what transpired at the meeting and typing them into minutes. It can be helpful if that person is typing those minutes as you go. Um, really, a lot of times folks are used to like transcription minutes, um, especially older folks, where you know verbatim you're taking down who said what. And my suggestion is that you don't really need that. I mean, it can be helpful, but what you really need to know is the key points that were raised on each topic and the decisions and then who's, how the decision is going to be implemented. And it can sometimes be a very onerous task to take minutes um, in that way that keeps track of everything and um, you can burn out the folks who are best, the best note takers if you're asking them to do that. So being clear about what you really need. Also making it so that people are going to actually look at those notes again rather than having 12 pages of you know all the points of discussion and then you know nobody ever looks at them and then <laughs> nobody remembers what they signed up to do. Uh, timekeeper is a really important role. The timekeeper is responsible for letting the group know when a discussion time is almost over, so giving like a five minute warning and for letting folks know when the time is up. So my strong suggestion is that every agenda should have times on them, on each item and then the timekeeper, not the facilitator, is responsible for keeping track of the clock. And um, oftentimes we use half time and then a five minute warning and then time. And somebody who's keeping time has to be someone who's comfortable basically like in the middle of the discussion, not maybe in the middle of a speaker, but in between two different speakers talking, saying, you know, we're at half time and not being polite and just waiting and then, you know, oh, we're 20 minutes over time, but I didn't want to interrupt anyone. No, the timekeeper is supposed to jump in there at the right time to make sure that people know um, where they are on the time, because otherwise you will run over time, and that's a good way to get things out of whack. Um, vibe watch, vibes Watcher can be helpful to just kind of keep track of the feelings of the room. Um, tries to make sure everyone is more fully being heard. So this is something a facilitator can do too, but it can be helpful to have somebody who is specifically asked to take on this role. And um, by making it intentional, then if that person types up and says, you know, that, that, that maybe call, calls vibes, that um, everyone knows that it's not personal, but that was actually something that was intentional. It also might not be necessary. It's kind of up to you and how your group works. Uh, snack master doesn't need to be explicit. Everyone can help chip in for that, but it can be good to um, help people focus on the discussion if there's food and people are not hungry. Um, if their stomachs are growling, then they're not probably going to be paying attention. And then participants is oftentimes left off of the list, but I think it's really key that um, everyone else in the meeting is responsible for the facilitator and these other folks doing her or his job by following the ground rules, keeping on topic, and basically self-facilitating and acting um, from a you know self-aware space instead of just saying, hey, it's all on the facilitator to make sure this goes well. It's really everyone's responsibility to make sure that um, the meeting goes well, and it's each individual's responsibility to make sure that they're taking into account and being aware of um, the needs of the group as a whole. So, on an, so you can build the whole structure of a meeting such that to help you come to conclusions, come to decisions, and uh, to get your business done. So there are different ways to structure an agenda, but um, here's my suggestion of some of the pieces you want to make sure to include. One is a check-in. This can be really fast and just do a go-around to get everybody comfortable speaking in the space. And also, it can be a good way to um, make sure to be aware of anything that um, people might need to tell the whole group in terms of what's going to affect them. So, you know, a check-in could be, 
I'm really tired. I didn't get any sleep last night, so um, I might ramble or be off topic or, or not as participatory and just listening. And um, by saying that, you know, you get a lot of information about the state that I'm in that if I hadn't said, you might come to all different kinds of conclusions about why I'm not making sense or uh, sitting there quietly and um, jump to conclusions that interfere or get in the way of our ability to work together to make decisions. Um, it can also be a good way to share kind of a highlight of what's, you know, just something good that happened today or um, it doesn't all have to be like, you know, here are the things that are going to hinder me from doing well in this meeting. It might be, I'm, I'm in a really good mood because uh, my sister just had a baby and I'm excited or whatever. Um, the schedule. So you want to have things, you know, I think it's always helpful if an agenda is really clear with um, an order that makes sense, times attached to each item that are realistic about how much time it will need and that are, you know, weighted so that uh, the more important topics have more time given to them and the less important topics have less time. That also helps the participants know what the priorities are. Um, and also uh, important to maybe include the name of the person who's going to uh, frame out that topic or who's responsible for bringing the past information about a topic to the space. And um, sometimes it can be helpful, too, to even just jot in a few notes, even just on the agenda, to refresh folks of, you know, background stuff they'll need to read to be up to speed or, um, you know, kind of where the discussion left off last time if this is an, a continuing item. It's a good idea to put a place in the agenda for announcements. Um, it's sort of... Uh, different people's preference, whether to put those announcements at the beginning or at the end. Um, oftentimes they they are put at the end, but I put them up front because then you get them out of the way. And if you put them at the end, people might fear that they're not going to be gotten to, or they might forget that they're on the agenda. And if that's something that's really important to them, they'll be more inclined to insert their announcements or non-agenda items into the agenda um, if they haven't had a chance to just say them all up front. So announcements are things that have no discussion attached to them. So um, you want to make sure that, you know, if you start to get into a discussion about an announcement item that um, that's intentional. So maybe pausing and saying, you know, it seems like we do need to discuss this. It's not an announcement. Let's put it on the agenda at the end. Or, you know, let's take five minutes to discuss this right now. Um, but other than that, announcements should be, you know, no discussion, nobody needs to respond, it's just putting it out there. One thing I forgot to say on the schedule is that it is important to, again, going back to transparency, to make sure that you do have a time for agenda review. And ideally, people see the agenda before they show up at the meeting, so sending it out by email in advance is a good idea. But um, whether it was sent out in advance or not, having some time at the beginning to just make go run through it, make sure everyone understands it. That's where you can um, identify, you know, well, we've, we've allotted 30 minutes to this item because we all agreed last time that it was really important. That means that we only have, you know, 10 minutes to get to this other stuff. And it also means that, you know, we really need to come to a conclusion because we've been talking about this item for three meetings now and the goal is really to, to um, come to a conclusion. So you can kind of give people the kind of overview of the priorities and what's most important and just sort of make sure that they're oriented in the right way for being able to be good participants in the meeting. And also, um, if there's anything that they strongly disagree with, better to know that at the beginning, um, whether it's the amount of time something's been allotted or the fact that something's even on the agenda at all or if something has been left off it's just better to know that at the beginning, take a few minutes to um, basically consent on the agenda before you dive in because if people are not in consensus about the agenda, um, that is going to come up. And even if you try to try to avoid that by not having an opportunity for people to talk about it, um, that's just a way to make sure that they talk about it in other ways that you don't, you know, other places that are not productive. So giving them that time to be transparent is important. Um, appreciations can be good to kind of 
put in explicitly and that's not you know, necessary but just kind of highlighting if there's somebody who did a lot of work between the last meetings or played a key role in some success that you've had recently um, lots of times where we put a lot more time into where to critique ourselves and each other so um, being appreciative of the time that we're spending especially because we're all volunteers is really important I already did a gender review out of order. And then my suggestion is to do old business first and then new business. Um, again, that's, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Let's pretend like 5.5 says old business. <laughs> and then new business is six. Um, make sure you get through the stuff that you already had in progress before you cover new stuff can help um, keep everybody sane. Make in a little bit of time for evaluation at the end just to make sure to um, again, be transparent, make the space to, for people to offer improvements or suggestions for how to do it better, and also to say what worked really well so that you can make sure to do it again next time. And then building in breaks. You, people can't sit for more than definitely two hours without having a break, um, but it's not a bad idea to um, include a break. You know, even if, if you have a two hour meeting, maybe putting a break in the middle. Be careful about breaks because that can be a good way to have the energy completely change and potentially people say, oh, now's a good chance for me to run out of here. So um, you want to be careful about breaks, but at the same time, forcing people to sit through multiple hours will just ensure that they're not going to be very good participants. So just a couple more slides here. A lot of times people ask for some suggestions for meeting ground rules or participation guidelines. So I just wanted to run through um, the ones that we use at Democracy Unlimited. Um, there are certainly others that you could add, and some of these may not feel right for you. But either way, whatever you have here on this participation ground rules guidelines um, sheet, you want to make sure that everyone agrees with them and can follow through on following them. And it's a good idea to not assume that people will remember them just because you came up with some like five months ago. So having them on the wall at every meeting really helps the facilitator take responsibility for making sure that they're followed and have everybody just remember um, what it is that they're, uh, you know, what they're, how they're supposed to be conducting themselves. So I'm just going to run through these really quick. A lot of them are self-explanatory, but there's a few that aren't. Step up, step back is in some ways kind of the most critical. It's asking the whole, each person to take responsibility for themselves and how they are in the meeting. So the way that I normally describe this one is that there are some of us who are quick to speak. We might be auditory learners. Uh, we might um, think out loud. And we might just process information better if we're talking about it. So we're, we might be inclined to just jump right in to the conversation. Um, I am one of those people who has to remind myself um, to step back because that is on how I am. So asking those folks to step back. And then the flip side of that is that oftentimes there are folks who, I don't think so much it's shyness, although it might be shyness, but I wouldn't describe it this way if you're the facilitator. I would describe it as maybe you're more um, an internal thinker. You might be more introverted and process things internally. Um, and you know, tend to be more quiet in groups. And so um, you might be hanging back. And it probably isn't because there isn't anything that you think. You know, it's not that you don't have an opinion on the topic, it's that you're processing it inside your head instead of out loud. And so asking those folks to step up and kind of meet in the middle. And one thing that is, I think, important to note is oftentimes these two roles are gendered. I mean, not always, like I'm a woman and I, you know, I'm the one who's having to remind myself to step back, but oftentimes um, in a group, it is the men who are more um, able to just quickly step up and start diving into the conversation. And unless uh, you remind yourself and you take some responsibility for stepping back to make the space, the space is oftentimes not there. So. Um, I think that it is important. This is one of the most important ones. And um, whether or not it is gendered in your group, it is worth kind of talking about that a little bit explicitly, because um, certainly it's not only women's responsibility uh, to um, 
to take responsibility for uh, for privilege that might men might have and uh, um, making it more likely for them to be the ones stepping up. Sometimes the, it can also be um, racial or age uh, related too, in terms of who's stepping up and who's. Stepping up. back so just keeping all that um, transparent again and, and asking people to take responsibility for that and then observing if you know the same folks are talking all the time um, not in a way that's accusatory but more just that it's you know that's not the goal the goal is to have everyone meeting in the middle and participating so that you can have the wisdom of the whole group along those same lines sharing the airtime and not interrupting um, are kind of just two principles that help with um, step up and step back. We're all responsible for the meeting going well or using our time well. Again, a lot of times people put this responsibility on the facilitator, and I think it's really helpful if your group is explicit about that being a collective responsibility um, so that uh, you, know, you can help the facilitator and in fact, ideally take responsibility yourself and not even need to be facilitated because you're self-facilitating. Starting and ending on time, I think, is really important. Uh, turning off cell phones and expect unfinished business, um, but have a plan for where to put it. So uh, you're not going to solve the world in every affiliate meeting that you have, and you might not even solve all your issues. So being allowing yourselves to be okay with not finishing everything, um, you know, necessarily, especially if you're if you're using consensus, but at the same time, really being disciplined about making sure that you don't just have, you know, hanging threads where, you know, you discuss something and then time's up and then it's over and um, there's no decisions made about how you're going to get to a decision with that unfinished item. So whether it's going to go to a committee to come forward with some proposals or you're just going to put it on the next agenda item or maybe you're going to take some items off this agenda and talk about them next time because this other issue is so important. But being explicit and transparent about all of those things so that there's intentionality because people will get frustrated if there isn't um, and feel like you know, you're know you not actually getting anything done, which is definitely not the space you want people to be in. So quick couple points, things that happen all the time for facilitators. If a point is going on too long and the group is just sort of going round and round and round, a facilitator can help by jumping in and summarizing the discussion that's happened so far and some of the key points, and also reminding the group um, that there's other meeting priorities and suggest tabling the question for a later time or being explicit about, you know, if we're going to talk about this for this long, we're probably going to need to take five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes away from another item. So just kind of helping the group be clear about whether it is intending to actually be talking about something for as long as it is. If two members get into like a real back and forth and everybody else is just sort of watching the ping pong game go on and on, a facilitator can help by summarizing the points made by each side and then turning the discussion back to the group. So, you know, okay, Tom and Ralph have clearly said, you know, that this is their perspective and um, what does everyone else think? And also you could invite the two to stay after the meeting um, and you could talk it over with them as the facilitator. So sort of removing it outside of the group setting and saying, you know, it seems like the two of you all could maybe benefit from having more time to talk about this, but we don't have the time as a group. So maybe if you all could stay after, I'd be happy to join you and we can see if we can come to some kind of resolution. Um, sometimes there's a one man show and that somebody's kind of just hogging all the space. So, um, you can help as a facilitator by interrupting with a statement that gives the speaker credit for, for his contribution, but politely asks him or her to hold any other points until later. Or you could interrupt and say, you've brought that up many times, and that would keep us busy for a long time. Would anyone else like to respond to any of these points? So you'll notice that both of these two items say interrupt, and a lot of times we're taught that it's impolite to interrupt, but it's actually really important that a facilitator both feel personally empowered to interrupt when necessary to make sure to keep things on track, and also that there's a culture in the group that is okay for the facilitator to interrupt when they're doing that um, for the good of the group. Obviously, a facilitator that just interrupts with their own opinion or, you know, because they have an agenda is not facilitating well, but um, 
if the goal is to kind of get things back on track, don't feel like you have to politely wait until, you know, something's done, because that might be never. Um, okay, when somebody's drifting from the subject and not on topic, again, you can interrupt, give them credit for the idea, but say that they're, you know, kind of starting to get off track, departing from the main point. Or you could put up to the group the question of whether it wants to stray from the outline or follow it. So, you know, sounds like uh, what Alana said has kind of taken us into this other realm. Um, and now, you know, Mark wants to respond. Is that is that where we want to go? Do we want to take a few minutes now to kind of iron that out? So to keep it intentional. Um, or you could bring the discussion back on topic by using the related idea as the transition. So kind of like, you know, yeah, that's a really good point. And um, at the same time, you know, that, that brings us back to blah, blah, blah. So just kind of restating what you're supposed to be talking about and brushing through um, the tangent. If someone is having difficulty expressing herself or himself, um, as a facilitator, you can help build up her, his confidence by expressing appreciation for what the person has said and then rephrasing it. So um, it sounds like what you're saying, Nancy, is blah, 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 blah. Am I hearing you right? Or is this what you mean? Um, and that can help, uh, you know, as, uh, as a, a good, good facilitator, we'll be able to kind of pick up on those things and um, help a person maybe be more concise or clear or on point even if they're not able to do it themselves. So you don't want to, you know, you want to be patient and not um, totally marginalize um, them, even if they're, you know, not expressing it in the way that is, maybe they don't know quite know what they want to say yet. And so helping them get there is one of the other jobs of the facilitator. So let's pause there and see, I see that there were some points that were brought up earlier. I'm going to move this over a little bit so I can see. And then if you have um, questions or comments, now would be a good time to start typing them in while I look through some of this. And I do know that there were some folks who um, were hoping that we'd talk more generally about getting the amendment passed. And again, there are definitely uh, um, trainings that have covered that, but this topic is on um, you know, how, to, how to facilitate your meetings well. So I'm going to skip the ones that aren't to this. OK. So Tim from Lake County, California um, points out that you can definitely have co-facilitators um, to help explain where to put input info as new folks are participating. So um, yeah, that can either be a co-facilitator's role, or actually, you could have um, and I've seen some groups do this, have somebody who's sort of responsible for even greeting new folks, making sure that they understand um, consensus and that they're you know, clear on the plan and also just to feel welcome, just to talk to them a little bit at the beginning and um, ask a little bit about themselves. So if you're you know, publicizing your meetings publicly, that can be a good idea to have somebody who's because otherwise that, that topic um, or that task might go by the wayside. So trying to make sure that it's intentional is a good idea. So is there anybody who has any questions? I'm a, I hope that this is working. Um, I don't see any. Anybody have any comments or things to add? Um, things that you're doing that are working well for you? or um, ways that you have solved issues that your group has had about um, how things are going? No? I see that you're still here. All right. Um, OK, it looks like folks are good. All right, one thing that I. Um, one thing that I would suggest you take a look at in the toolkit, there is a packet of a few pages called Group Process, Decision Making, and Meetings um, that has a lot of the content that I shared. So if you want to kind of go over it with your group, that can be a good thing um, to do. It's got basically everything I went through here. 
and um, I would suggest again like if you don't already have ground rules for your meetings making some up and proposing them at the next meeting um, if you're not using some of these roles um, then again being explicit about trying them on it could be a good way to move in the direction of having the full group take responsibility um, for the making sure that things are going well is if, if folks are sharing the load and it's not all just on you the facilitator which may be what's happening the other thing is to try and share that facilitation role that can be a little bit dicey if you've got new folks who don't have experience facilitating but that can be as Tim said a good way to um, take care of that is to have co-facilitators um, who share the load and maybe somebody who's experienced and somebody who um, is less so to kind of start learning and get some training so it looks like um, I'm not seeing that anyone has any questions or comments so um, but there are some feedbacks that this worked and got what folks needed um, so I, I do see Ken's question I think for, Ken is from Chicago Kenneth um, so I'll take that real quick oops sorry um, to amend the Constitution is the particular goal question yes <laughs> absolutely so move to amend is a is a coalition of a number of different organizations and we do have constitutional renewal and sort of, and, and real democracy in the United States as our long-term goal but the campaign that we are working on right now um, is to get an amendment passed that clearly establishes that corporations are not people and money is not speech so right now that's the top priority and that's what our affiliates are working on and kind of where all resources are going to at the moment so um, Next steps, this is the last slide. Uh, if you would please complete the survey at the end of this webinar, you'll automatically be directed there after we end. So it'll just be um, a web page that'll um, not take you very long to give us some feedback to make sure that um, we do these as well as we can in the future. And then you're invited to participate in next month's um, webinar, which is on March 6th. They're always on the first Tuesday of the month. And um, the topic is first steps towards coalition building with communities of color. Um, so I know that's something that we've been um, asking our affiliates to work on, reaching out and working with um, communities of color that live in your community. And a lot of folks have said, you know, well, help me get started. How, how would I do that? I don't even know where to really begin. So we're gonna talk about that in our next webinar. And I'm really hoping that we'll have a special guest with us um, George Friday, who is on the Move to Amend Executive Committee. She lives in North Carolina, and she has a lot of experience doing anti-oppression trainings. And um, I think that she and I will be leading the next webinar on March 6th. And if you have any questions to follow up, um, please contact us at the email address, info at Move to Amend, or give us a call. So. Um, Thanks again, everybody, for being here. I hope this was helpful for your affiliate groups. I know that a lot of folks have been asking for the facilitation training. And again, um, there is a handout on the website, group process, decision-making, and meetings that 